Hey, hello everybody, how's it going? Ben Gothard here with another Project Egg interview, and today we are talking to Ryan Stuman from Dallas, Texas. How you doing today, Ryan? What's up, Ben? Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely, it's a it's a pleasure to do so. Uh, let's let's start off this podcast by asking you, what is your story? Well, man, I don't know. Who listens to your show? I guess we should ask that first, man. If this is like some kind of Christian programming, I need to like make sure that we uh, we, we, we make my story appropriate because my story is not your typical average everyday story. So uh, like what you got some rules that I need to know about before we just cut loose on here? <laughs> Absolutely not. This is a okay. you know, rule free zone here. All right. So my uh, my story is that at age seven, I was adopted. Uh, by the age of 15, I, I left school, ran away from home, uh, never went back, and uh, not willingly, at least. And uh, by the age of 19, I, I was selling drugs, running, gang banging the streets and shit like that here in Dallas. And uh, the age of 19, I was dead. I uh, overdosed on drugs and died and was luckily brought back to life so that the police could arrest me. You know, it's like, uh, which at the time was like, damn it, you guys could have just let me do my thing here, but now I realize it was for a reason. Uh, went and did time in prison in my early 20s, and uh, I guess I liked it so much that I went back in my later 20s and for uh, gun charges, and uh, they, they they charged me. It's this weird thing in Texas. Like, in Texas, if you've committed a crime, you can have a gun uh, if you're a felon. Uh, however, the ATF doesn't recognize that that's uh, an actual thing, and so Long story short, I got caught with a gun, and, and the ATF picked up the case, and uh, I'm like the unluckiest lucky bastard on the planet. Uh, but during that time, I was I was doing mortgages, and I was really good at mortgages, so I was making a whole bunch of money, and uh, basically lost it all, went to prison. Ten years ago this July, I'll have left, uh, I would have left federal prison uh, July 11th, 2008, with $25 to my name. And here today... Uh, after lots of ups and downs and businesses and everything else, I sit here with the eight-figure net worth. I run eight different companies. I'm in one of the nicest buildings in Dallas with a, a nice view of the uh, the street. I'm in the corner office, all that good stuff. Of a, a, a building that I I personally pay for, and uh, dude, you know, I have a wife, three kids, uh, an exotic car collection. You know, I fly first class everywhere. I speak on the stages with huge people like Marshall Silver, Russell Brunson, Frank Kern, and and I've uh, shared the stage with Tony Robbins. I just, you know, live what would be a, an amazing life now, uh, which has its ups and downs. You know, it's not always rainbows and sunshine over here. I'm running businesses and, and, and surviving the struggle like everybody else. But, um, but I've been through a hell of a lot of trials and tribulations in life. And our motto over here at our company is fuck your excuses, right? Because I figure if I can come through all of this and come out the other side, as an entrepreneur, I mean, think about it. I have every reason to have failed. You know, it's like, oh, my daddy didn't love me. Oh, my 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 life was abusive. Oh, I, I'm, I'm a drug addict. Oh, I, I've been to prison. I'm a convicted felon. Like all these excuses that I can have to just be some average, normal, everyday dude. But instead, you know, we have 90 million people walking around on this planet that know who I am. And uh, and they know my story and I'm not ashamed of it. Like I, I go out to eat. People buy me dinner. Just random strangers pay for my dinner and stuff. Like I've had to teach my kids, like if they haven't been over daddy's house, we don't really know them. Like it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a really cool life now, but it's not always been that way. But I'm proof that if you just fight the struggle long enough, you can come out the other side smelling like roses, or at least like petunias. You know. <laughs> That's incredible. That's incredible. So, uh, I want to I want to go back to uh, you said at age seven when you were adopted. Um, can you talk about? what impact that has actually had on you today and how that shows itself in your entrepreneurial career. Man, one thing you know, uh, you'll learn about me really quick is I'm aware. I'm not one of these people that's like, oh, I don't know. It's like, I'm very aware of everything. And during the ages of three to seven, psychologically, that's when we develop our comprehension skills as adult, as humans, right? That's like stays with us all the way till we're adults. The things that happen to you between three and seven, a lot of the kids that their parents divorce between three and seven, that is the issues that they struggle with for their entire life. When you hear strippers say they got daddy issues and shit like that, it's because something in their life happened between three and seven. I have done my best for my kids. They're all, my oldest one's almost seven years old. He'll be seven this September. So I've done my best to make sure like his grandfather's still alive. Uh, it, you know, his mom and I are divorced, but we've had a great relationship. It wasn't like a nasty divorce. And we like, we get along perfectly. Like he has literally had no trauma in his life. Same thing. My middle kid's five. 
Same thing, I made sure that everything's been smooth on his end. His grandparents are still living. He hasn't had any dramatic experiences in his life, you know? And me, that was the exact opposite of what happened. What happened to me was from ages zero to five, my family was pretty well to do actually. We uh, we lived on a farm and uh, we're in the cutting horse business and, and which is very expensive horses. And uh, my grandfather on my mom's side was a banker. My grandfather on my dad's side was an entrepreneur. He owned a glass factory. And in the 80s, you probably don't remember this, but maybe some of your listeners, depending on their ages, in the 80s, there was something called savings and loans. They don't exist anymore, uh, but they all crashed. Like basically, you know, that bitch John McCain put them all out of business. Like people think of John McCain as this war hero senator, but that's that's exactly not who he is. He was a, a, a banking criminal. And so he put uh, he shorted all of the savings and loans and bought them up. So basically he bought the right to print money. That's how he, he basically got wealthy in the beginning. And so anyway, uh, long story short, he bankrupted the savings and loan industry. My family went from like driving brand new cars and living in fancy houses and all this stuff to like ran out of town because like they lost everybody's money and nobody wanted to associate with us. My mother and father got divorced. Uh, my grandfather moved like out in the middle of like this town of like 300 people. My other grandfather, they, they were fighting because it, it caused his business and the glass factory to go bankrupt because of the fact that the, the banks went under. And there's nothing that either one of my grandfathers could have done. It was just a, a, a rough time. And the economy collapsed, you know, and, and it happened again in 2008 with the subprime mortgage meltdown. It's the same thing. It was just a, a different banking thing. So bankers get greedy and then they got to take a haircut every now and then. That's just it's how that cyclical industry works. And so. Uh, a lot of shit happened to me during that time. My family went from being rich to being broke. Uh, my, I went from having two parents to, to, you know, losing my dad. My dad abandoned me all together, gave me up, and I ended up getting adopted by this dude that I didn't even like. You know, my mom remarried a few years later, and I didn't even like the dude. But my dad was behind on child support payments and was going to go to jail, and he was trying to win a cut and horse championship or some dumb shit like that. And so uh, he gave me up over, over money, basically. And so I learned at a young age, like, people will do anything for money. And then money just like comes and goes and, and you know, shit, you just, I, I, it gave me a scarcity mentality is what I'm getting at. So I, I look at throughout my entire life until recently, and I mean recently, like last couple of years, I've always had the scarcity mentality and these abandonment issues, right? So my father abandoned me, my family had money, lost money, and those were the experiences that, that as a young man were formed into my mind. Because here's, here's how the human brain works. We fire 20 to 40 neurons per minute in the front part of our brain, but the subconscious, which is actually the hard drive of the brain that stores everything, like the front, the conscious is like RAM. It's like random access memory, right? The hard drive is where all the memories are stored. There's like 20 to 40 million neurons that are firing per minute back there, but the RAM can only access 20 to 40 of them out of the millions that are going on back there. And so it has to be able to pick and choose. That's what differentiates somebody who's smart emotionally and intelligently from somebody who's not is how is what memories they can access with those 20 to 40 versus the 20 to 40 million that's happening at any, any given minute. And so you get deep psychology lesson on you real quick here. And so I understand that. So as I go through life, uh, you know, I was always I've been divorced three times. So I've had abandonment issues, you know, and, but I, I realized that it was my issues that caused those abandonment issues, you know, and 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 in the things that happened to me at a young age really shaped me all the way up until about one or two years ago to where I just said, man, you know, fuck, I keep repeating the same cycle over and over. Like, what's going on here? And then I start really studying into like I go to psychiatrists, I start going to personal development coaches and I start like rewiring my brain for success. Because here's what I know. Most of us were put on this planet and wired for success. Uh, we've been lied to our entire lives. We're told as little kids, like, and then they live happily ever after. We watch the movie and then they live happily ever after. And we, we think, okay, so if I just graduate school, we'll live happily ever after. If I, if I just, uh, and so I destroyed that for myself, by the way. And then I think, okay, well, if we just go to college and get a degree, then I'll live happily ever after. And you're like, okay, so if I just marry the woman of my dreams, then I'll live happily ever after. If I just make a million dollars, I'll live happily ever after. If I just get my dream job, I'll live happily ever after. And the truth is happily ever after is bullshit because it doesn't exist because there's never a finite point point where you're like, okay, fuck it. I made it. I'm out. But a lot of people think that like when professional athletes, they go and they say, if I just make it to the NFL, I'll live happily ever after. And then they make it there. They get injured two or three years later. And even though they have millions of dollars, they go broke five years later because they, they thought that that was the end of the game for them. And shit, they're only 24 years old, right? They've still got 70 years of their life left to go. And so, but what is going to be constant in Uh, Ram. Ram is not. Hey, yes. you, cut, you kind of cut out for a second. Oh. The, the last thing okay, I heard sorry. was 
um, what is going to stay constant is. Okay, gotcha. So what is going to stay constant is the struggle. And what happens is that you're going to wake up every day and you're going to struggle. And if you wake up every day and you go, I don't struggle, then the RAM, the, the frontal part of your, it's not accessing the right shit in the back of your brain. You're missing a lot of stuff because the struggle is constant. So what happens is we're taught to look for happily ever after and to avoid the struggle when the truth is happily ever after doesn't exist. It's a distraction to keep you from dealing with the shit that you got to deal with. And what you have to deal with is the struggle. Every day I show up at work, I'm going to have employee issues. I'm going to have client issues. I'm going to, and, and it doesn't have necessarily have to be bad. Like a client's mad or clients leaving or employees mad or client employees. It could be an employee's sick, could be a client needs time. And I have a busy schedule today. It could be any of those things. There's going to be a struggle. Could be an argument with my kids or they get in trouble at school or my wife and I have a disagreement on something. It, the struggle, is always going to be there, but we spend most of our lives trying to avoid the struggle because it might be painful for us instead of embracing it and learning from it. But it's like when you work out in the gym, you work out and you push yourself to failure, you push yourself through the pain so that you can grow. That's a metaphor for life in general. And so what I've realized is we've been taught to, by this by society that there's this happily ever after, which is a lie from what I call the force of average, right? Everything on this planet wants to keep you average because that's how things work. We need an average lifestyle. We need an average income. We need a, an average home price. We need an average business. We need to dress like the average person. We need the average haircut. And so we're, we're taught our whole life just to blend in and be average and be a good little boy and, and be quiet and all this other stuff. And that's like this the way that this planet runs. But those of us that break through that average, guess what? Gravity pushes us back down because Newton's law says for every uh, every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So as you step out and make a million dollars, first of all, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere else in your life, you're slipping. So most time what happens for businessmen is we make a million dollars, but we fuck up a marriage, right? We make a million dollars, but we get fat and out of shape and we get diabetes or cancer or something that we got to go spend that million dollars on. And then we're right back to average like everything else. Like, oh, I'm a millionaire, but I got diabetes. And I had to have this surgery and it cost me all this money. I hear these stories all the time. And that's because everything in this world is trying to push you back into the, the box that you fit in, right? They say, think outside of the box. Well, really, it's not a box. It's a globe. You have to think outside of the globe. You have to think outside of the way that the globe works. And so, you know, we, we, one of the things that the force of average does is it gets us to focus on happily ever after, which is truly a distraction instead of getting us to focus on the one thing that's constant, which is the struggle, because the biggest tool that we have as human beings to combat the force of average on this planet is focus. And so it's all in between. You could do anything you want. You know, Elon Musk, he decided he was going to get focused on going to Mars. Guess what? We go to Mars, motherfuckers. You know, uh, Bill Gates, he, he decided to get focused on the way that computers ran to make sure that computers ran the world. Guess what? Computers run the world. Uh, again, we use Elon Musk. He decided he was going to disrupt the banking system. He's done that, you know, like it, with PayPal. So anything you focus on, you can get. And so the force of average is constantly trying to distract you. Like most people don't know this, but you see 4,000 uh, advertisements every single day. Those are all distractions to keep you from doing what you're supposed to do. And we're wired to know what we're supposed to do. Like we're put here on this earth with a mission and that mission's in your conscious, right? The conscious is, Hey, you're supposed to be a preacher. You're supposed to be a speaker. You're supposed to be a teacher. You're supposed to be a coach. That's why you see some people that are teachers that live on $30,000 a year and they're happy as a pig in shit because they're doing what they were called to do. It ain't about money for them. It's about fulfillment, right? But then again, you'll see somebody else who's made $10 million and they just, they made $10 million here and the force of average has come against them and they got money, but they can't enjoy it because they have fucked up 10 marriages and, and their kids hate them and, and they got drug problems and all, and all this other stuff, right? And so we relate so much stuff to money, but it's all about listening to that voice in the back of your head and fight and using that focus to fight the distractions. I know I just went off on a really long tangent, probably gave you guys a shit ton of information to process, but that's... That's basically how that affected me and how I've, I've learned to deal with that shit and broke through. Because for years, I had ups and downs. I make a million dollars. I go to prison. I, I get the woman of my dreams. I fuck up the, the marriage, you know. And, and now for the last five years, I've really been, and especially the last two years, I've really been on this rocket ship with a lot of momentum that I have not had the force of it. I mean, it comes against me every day. But I don't hide from it. Right. I focus on it. I solve the problem. I don't play the victim mentality. It'd be easy for me to say, you know, oh, poor me. I've, I've had X, Y, Z circumstance in my life. But instead, I don't let that shit distract me because I'm focused on changing people's lives. Right. The, the fact that I'm a millionaire and I have all this money and all these nice things is a byproduct of the fact that I'm focused on helping people with the message like I'm sharing with you right now. Because there's people listening to this right now that are going, holy shit, that is deep.
Holy shit. And, it, and it's so simple. It's deep yet so simple that a fifth grader can understand it if I just explain it to them the way that I explain it to you guys. So I'm taking this big, complicated concept on how to live life and made it like stupidly simple. And then people are like, oh, shit, man, they wake up every day because of it. That is really deep. And, and I think you covered a lot of good points. And I kind of want to go and, and touch on a couple of them. Uh, you mentioned self-awareness. And you said at a very young age you developed self-awareness because of the things that happened to you and you had to to overcome them. Well, for somebody who maybe hasn't gone through that sort of trauma at a young age, how do you develop that self-awareness? You know, uh, a lot of that's going to come from reading books. A lot of that's going to, I've been, you know, I was 13 years old and somebody gave me some Zig Ziglar cassettes. And uh, for the young folks, those are like pre previous to iPods and fucking iPhones and all that. There was eight tracks, records, cassettes. And so, uh, somebody gave me some Zig Ziglar cassettes and I remember listening to it going, this is going to be me one of these days, right? That, that's, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to spread these messages. I remember at a young age, I was probably eight, eight or nine years old. I was at my grandparents and, uh, I was doing impressions of different people for, for Christmas. I, and I, as a young kid, they're all laughing at me and everything. And my grandpa would always say, dude, you're going to grow up to be a preacher. Well, I'm not a religious person, you know, and uh, I was at one time, but I, I'm not anymore, you know, and and uh, I'm not knocking it. I've got nothing against it. It's just that I don't know what to believe. So I just choose to do me. You know, I'm not that's not my concern. And so uh, but I'm spreading my own message, right? Like the way that religion is simply a way of life. And so I have my own way of life that I've adapted from all my experiences and all my worldly wisdom. And, and this is how I do it. And, and I realized like when I listened to those tapes at 13, my, my grandparents were saying these things over me at age seven and eight years old, listen to the tapes at, at, you know, age 13. And then by the time I'm 19 or 20, I'm going to multi-level marketing meetings, which I was never really into multi-level marketing, but I, I just, I always admired the people speaking from the stage. And I remember like it was yesterday in 2004, I read a book by Napoleon Hill called the law of success. Now, this is a 1,700-page book, and, and I set a goal that I was going to read this 1,700-page book. And I was like, you know what, man, I've never tackled a book this big. I've never tackled anything like this, but I'm going to go all in, and I'm going to read this book. And after I finished the book, I remember looking at my girlfriend at the time and saying, one day, I'm going to be on the stage in front of hundreds of thousands of people, and I'm going to be spreading some sort of message. But then my dumb ass just went back to flipping real estate. I never pursued that. I had this calling on my life my whole fucking life, and I never pursued it, right? Because here's what we do. We choose to ignore the things that we're supposed to do. Uh, I chose to ignore it by smoking weed and drinking and, and you know chasing women and, and chasing money and and trying to do all these other things where all along I'm supposed to be like even in business. You know now if you say hey Ryan what do you do? It's like hey I'm a coach. I'm a real estate investor. But the first thing I do is I coach people. You know and, and coaches do two things. They help people reach their goals and they hold them accountable. That's what I do. Right. I help people reach their goals I, through the information and the guidance that I share and I hold them accountable to getting those goals accomplished. But for years, if you ask me what I do, that'd be the last thing I'd tell you because I ran from it because I'm like, oh, you know, I run businesses. You know, I teach people Facebook ads. And, and that is part of what I do, too, because business is one part of having a, your entire life. Correct. Because if you don't have money, you can't even get on the damn bus. We know that. Right. And so the way that I look at it is you have business. So you have the four F's that we have. Every, a lot of people know this already, but there's like four areas of our life that we really have to cover. We have to have faith, family, fitness and finance. And forever I worked on finances and fitness. I'm a pretty fit dude overall. And, and you know, I worked on finances and fitness and I never worked on faith and I never worked on my family because I figured those things just take care of themselves. But if you think about that, that's some average shit. That's half, right? That's 50, 50, 50 percent of 100 would be average. Right. And so. Uh, with my life, as soon as I decided to level up in the other two areas. Now, a lot of people think faith has to be in some external thing like God or Allah or whatever your religion is, right? And that's cool. You probably should have that. However, real faith comes from inside yourself, like believing that you can achieve the things you do. A lot of people, they say, oh, you fake it till you make it. Why won't you just believe until you achieve? That's a whole lot better way of thinking. It's a better mantra to live by. And why wouldn't you believe that you're supposed to, instead of you know, so many people lack faith. They say lack faith. And even in the Bible, they say, oh, you have little faith. He didn't mean you have little faith in him. He meant you have little faith in what's possible together. And so like we we lack this faith in ourselves and we call it confidence or they tell you to be humble or whatever the hell. But you have to have faith in yourself like that. I can do this. If I didn't think that I could have the things that I have right now, there's no way that I would have them. Right. My belief system would allow me to get them and dump them because I didn't believe that I deserved them. But I remember when I was 16 years old. I, my office is here in the Dallas North Tollway, 
And I remember 16 years old riding in the back of my friend's S10. They had been stealing clothes and shit like that from the mall. And I, I'm not a thief. I didn't, I, but I was a accomplice, you know, I was there and I didn't do anything about it. And I remember riding in the back of the truck and a Ferrari passed us. And I told my friends that were in the, in the bed of the truck with me. Uh, and, and I'm looking at these buildings that I'm in now. And I said, one day I'm gonna have an office in one of those buildings that I don't work for somebody, but it's my office. And one day I'm gonna be driving a Ferrari like that. My friends are like, yeah, right, dude, we just left the mall stealing fucking clothes for beer money. And I'm like, y'all stole clothes for beer money. I'm working at a car wash. I, I'm, I'm taking the day off, you know, like you guys do this shit for a living. I'm just hanging out with you guys today for the beer, you know? And they made fun of me plenty of times over the years. Every time I went to prison, they were like, I knew he was doing something wrong. And I went to prison the second time for guns. And they were like, I bet he was stealing money from businesses and just blames it on guns and shit like that. Right. Because they were there trying to pull me down to their average ass level. Uh, but now, you know, I drove a $200,000 car to work today. And I'm in one of those fucking buildings because I believed it long before I achieved it. And I didn't fake it till I make it. You can go back on my YouTube channel and you can see where I have videos where I was at my in-laws house. And I'm like, I fucked up on a campaign and I lost my house. I, I, I spent my ad money the wrong way. I mismanaged my funds. I lost my job and I had to move in with my in-laws to save money. You didn't hear me you know, on the camera going, oh, you know, everything's perfect over here. Suit and tie, church on Sunday. I'm like, yo, I fucked up, but watch this. I'll get it all back because I've lost this shit before. All this shit could go out the window right now. And in two years, I'll have it right fucking back because I have faith in myself. And a lot of people, they lack that. And that's a key. That's 25% of success is having faith in yourself. The other 75 is in your fitness and taking care of your fitness because nobody wants to work their whole entire life to make money that they end up giving to doctors at the end of their life to, to, to keep their life, right? Uh, the other one's finances, obviously, and then family. You know, I show up for my kids last night. My wife and I, uh, we went on date night from 7 p.m. to 1 p.m. It was just us, me and her. We went out drinking and having a good time and laughing and dinner. And, you know, we went to, you know, a, a very expensive hotel and club in, in, in Dallas and hung out. Then, you know, we finished the night like one last drink before we go home, you know. And, you know, it's just uh, I make sure that I level up for them too. my wife now. Today, tomorrow she flies out to Arizona for a couple of days to spend some time with their girlfriends. They're all getting together and hanging out and having fun. And, uh, and I'll be spending with my, my sons, you know, so I'll spend the next uh, three days with just me and my sons and I'll be investing in my sons and showing up for my family. No work, no, none of that shit. But guess what? They'll run with me in the mornings. My little five and six year old can run two or three miles with me. No problem because they're learning these, these four F's in life and why they're so damn important. So again, kind of, uh, a long-winded answer there, but you know, obviously, I have a lot of energy and a lot of shit to share in a short period of time. But at the same time, I think all this is important, especially because you probably have a, a younger audience that listens to this. And this is a—I'm only 38 years old, so I'm not too old. Uh, but I have a hell of a lot of worldly wisdom, man. I might as well be 60 with the shit that I see. I'm like the old Vietnam vet, like I've seen some shit, man. You know, <laughs> and had some experiences. But a lot of that comes from understanding those principles I gave you and then reading books, getting involved in CDs, buying programs like mine, buying programs like, you know, Tony Robbins, buying programs like, you know, you look at guys like Grant Cardone, they, they, they disguise themselves as business people and sales trainers, but really what we are is we're life coaches. You know, we're teaching you how to do life and, and, and to make money is a part of that, but really overall how to do life. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I like what you said about how all the people who are, you know, who have these incredible courses like, you know, yourself and, and Grant Cardone and Tony Robbins, at the end of the day, I feel like everybody's just trying to help, you know, trying so, trying to help other people. And I think that's a very noble cause. So, you know, you said what most people oh. I, I want to say this real quick. What most people don't know about us three in particular is like we do this as a way to give back. Like I don't have to do what I do right now. Right. I've been a millionaire in real estate for a while now. I've been, I was a millionaire in the mortgage business before that. Like, I don't have to teach people, right? I have to because that's my calling. Grant Cardone, he manages $700 million worth of real estate. He doesn't have to fucking sell sales training. He doesn't have to. He does that as his way to help people. give. Does he make a lot of money from it? Hell yeah. Do I make a lot of money from it? Hell yeah. We don't have to. Grant could go sell roofs and make millions of dollars. I could go I could go wash cars and make millions of dollars, right? Because we just know how to make money. Tony Robbins, he has like 36 different companies that make a combined total of $5 billion every year. His speaking deal is just one of those entities, right? He doesn't have to do that shit, right? 
It, but the difference is he's giving back. Does he get paid? Absolutely. Because if you don't pay and you get free information, you will not do it. Free information leads to zero implementation. I know that. for, And they know that as well. And it is a nice you know, living and it's a fulfilled living. It allows being paid to do what we do allows us to be able to do what we do. Right. But none of us have to do this shit. They, like you don't believe Grant Cardone could go own a car dealership and make 10, 20, 30 million dollars a year like he does from sales training. Absolutely. He could. You don't think Tony Robbins could go and manage a business and, and be the CEO of some Fortune 500 business and, and make it more money, if not as much as he's making right now? Absolutely, he can. Same with me. I could go get a sales job selling roofs right now and I could make $20 million a year. The difference is we do this because we're helping other people. We truly do care. If not, we keep the shit to ourselves. And a lot of people hate and they say, well, those who can't coach or, or these guys are just snake oil salesmen or whatever. And that's their limiting belief, not ours, because you truly like, if you look at me, man, I've been online for eight years. I'm not on the ripoff report. I'm not on the salty droid. I have delivered results for my clients a hundred fucking percent of the time for eight years running, right? That's because I care. I'm not in this for money. That's because I actually care. If someone has a problem, I don't tell them the fuck off. I try to fix it for them and make sure. Because here's one thing, you guys, if you if you listen to this, you'll remember in life. It's not how you say hello to somebody because we all put our best foot forward when we say hello to somebody. It's how you say goodbye that matters. I think that's like the perfect thing to, to hang up on a wall or, you know, tweet that out. Tweet that hard. Um so, you know, I, I definitely would encourage everybody that's listening to, to go back through and listen to the things that Ryan is saying because, I mean, Ryan, you've been dropping a lot of value bombs in a very short amount of time. <laughs> short period of time. <laughs> very <no>. short period <laughs> of time. So I definitely encourage everybody who's listening to listen to this a couple times and really pick through all the different things that Ryan's been saying. So, uh, Ryan, you mentioned how in 2008 um, you went to prison. I believe that was that was the time frame. How did you go from uh, being in prison to now having an eight-figure net worth and having, I believe you said, eight different companies? How, what was that chronology and how did you do it? You, you ready for this? It's going to be the craziest shit you ever heard, but I, I want to start it off with saying this. Your worst days are your best days. And as soon as you look at life this way, you will have a perspective change that there's no going back on. And I get a little emotional because this was the worst day of my life. But but your worst days are your best days. Two days, I had to go to prison. I, they sentenced me in April about this time, right? It was like April 12th or 13th. They told me it would be – I had to go on to 12th. 13th. So it would be April 15th. So just in a few days, 10 days from now, I would be getting sentenced 10 years ago. And they say you have 60 days to get your affairs in order. And then you have to drive yourself to prison. Now, can you imagine having to drive yourself to prison? They didn't have Uber back then, so I had to bum a ride with somebody, right? And But like literally turn yourself, like voluntarily walk in the fucking house of hate, you know? Well, June 12th of, it was 2007. I got out 2008, but June 12th of 2007, where I got to be in on June 15th is my due date, right? June 12th, I had married my girlfriend, and uh, we've been together for about three years, and I had I had married her so that she could manage my estate while I was gone. I owned 32 houses, 30, 33 houses, counting the one I lived in. Um, I had uh, three companies that I ran and a, a mortgage pipeline with about a million dollars in, in money, not a million dollars in mortgages, but a million dollars in, in income set up for them. I trained her how to do all this stuff. I spent you know, the last year doing that, and especially the last 60 days getting everything in order. I had hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in securities and, and, and stocks and things like that. Um, June 12th, we go out to eat and this is the worst day of my life. We go out to eat dinner and when we were done eating dinner, I looked, we were driving down the street. She's driving. I have one glass of whiskey and, uh, I said, you know, man, I'd really like to smoke weed. You know, it's like, I, I just like, I hadn't smoked weed in like two years. And I said, man, this shit's really fucking compounded in my head and I just want to get high. You know, I just call your brother. Her brother's a drug dealer. Say, call your brother and uh, tell him to bring some weed over to the house. And so we get her, her brother on the phone and he's like, nah, man, y'all gonna have to come pick it up. It's like, listen, man, I'm not gonna come pick it up because if I get pulled over with it, I'm gonna go to jail two days before I gotta go to prison. That's fucked up, you know? Uh, and I loaned her brother money. He's a piece of shit, right? I loaned him money and I mean, he's a drug dealer, you know? And like two typical drug dealers, he was very selfish and he's like, nah, man, if you're not come get it, then fuck you. What are you gonna do? You're gonna go to jail in three days, you know, fuck off. And I'm like, so I hung up the phone with him. I was like, your brother's a fucking loser, man. This motherfucker. I just started going off on her brother, you know. 
And she reached across the car. And she, she was driving and she punched me with her right hand. And she was a very athletic chick, you know. She was like, she played softball in college and, and uh, packed a mean punch, man, and busted my eye open. Blood splattered all over the window of the car. She hit me with one of her rings that she had on. And then she hit me again. And I'm like, damn, we've never even argued at this point. Like, never, we've been together, Ben, for three, four years and never had an argument. And now all of a sudden, this chick's fucking beating the shit out of me. And I, she's a 110 pound chick. I'm not going to fucking beat her up or whatever. So the third time she went to hit me, I grabbed her arm. I we were we were rolling to the stop sign, and because she was driving slow enough to be able to hit me, and I grabbed her arm. I flipped the center, uh, you know, the the gear shift into neutral. I hit it up into neutral, and pulled the emergency brake so that it slowed the car down, and I got the fuck out of the car. And but I will tell you. You know, all honesty, I was grabbing the shit out of her arm because, A, I didn't want it to slip loose and hit me in the face again. I was bleeding everywhere, and it all just happened so fucking fast, you know. And I got out of the car, and she got out of the car and chased me around, and I ran and got in the driver's side and locked the doors, right? So I'm safe. Just let this bitch calm down. What the fuck just happened? Holy shit. It's my eye bleeding. Look in the mirror. Like, oh, fuck, dude. How, what in the fuck is my life coming to, you know? She's like, okay, I'm cool. I'm chill. Let's just fucking go home. Don't say shit about my brother again. I'm like, all right. I unlocked the door and she sat down in the passenger seat. I hauled ass home, right? I'm not going to, like, now I'm driving. If she starts hitting me, then we could be in jeopardy, right? It's like, look, I didn't even know this chick was capable of this shit. So I get home. I go in the backyard. I was wearing a shirt similar to where I'm wearing now. I went in the backyard and, like, get my head straight. You know, I was like, fuck, dude. I, I, I like, I, I lit up a cigar. And uh, that, I, that I had had forever. I didn't even smoke cigars, but I had one that somebody had given me a long time ago at a wedding or some shit. I'm sitting back there, I'm smoking the cigar, taking the shirt off. And ironically, I had a wife beater shirt on, still covered in blood. And I see somebody walk through my house, coming through to the backyard. I'm like, what the fuck is this? And so I put the cigar out and I look and it's the fucking police. She called the police and told them that I had beat her up. And then she had been like, she showed them her arm where. I had scratched her or whatever, grabbing her arm that she had been hit me. Clearly, she had beat me up. If there was anybody that won that fight, it was clearly her because my eye was fucking black and swollen and cut blood all over me. But I was already a convicted felon. She was a cute 110-pound chick, and I'm just this guy that's already been committed to two felonies and you know drug dealing and gang banging and all this other fucking shit in my life. And so they took me to prison, took me to jail two days before I had to go to prison. I go to jail. And, you know, shit, this is like maybe 10 o'clock at night when they arrest me. And I'm like, how the fuck does this even happen? I go to jail. I call my boss the next day because he's the only phone number I knew to bail me out. He sends a dude from work to come and get me out of jail. And it was like 2500 bucks to get out of jail or whatever the case may be. And I get released from jail. And while I was in there, she got a restraining order on me. And I wasn't allowed to go back to my house. I couldn't even pack bags. I, mean, I had to go buy a toothbrush. She had drained, within 12 hours, she had drained all of my bank accounts. She had taken all of the restraining order, so I couldn't even go in the house to move my furniture. And I'm like, what? All this shit was premeditated, man. She had set me up. She had been cheating on me with the fucking landscape guy, and I didn't even know it. And she was worried that I might find out and then take my money and give it to my family or something like that to keep a control of while I was gone. And her and the landscaper had conspired to fucking rob me basically. So two days before I go to prison, I'm basically homeless. I had to go sleep on the couch at my friend's house. And, and I went and I don't even like my parents. I don't even talk to them now. And I crashed on their couch one night. And they blame me like you just fucking, you just blah, 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 blah. I'm saying, dude, I bought this house for you motherfucker. Shut the fuck up. You know? And so I got to go turn myself in. I don't know that she's with the landscaper, though. I'm just still trying for three months. I'm in jail and I'm still trying to figure out how the fuck those two days before jail that that scenario happened. And, and I'm trying to tell myself, like, maybe I'm going to get out. And we're just going to have a happy marriage. And it was just a high stressful time. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that she's been cheating on me or any of this shit. I, maybe she was just protecting her interest and making sure I didn't spend the money she did. I owed like a three thousand dollar fine. She did pay the three thousand dollar fine off to the when I, they sentenced me to fifteen months in prison and like a three thousand dollar fine. So she paid the fine for me and and a few other things and 
I just, I did my time, you know, while I was in there, I made the most of my time. I taught all the drug dealers how to clean up their drug money and buy real estate, right? It was a Shawshank redemption moment for me. And I get out 2008 with $25 to my name. 15 months later would be June 15th. I went in, it would be like July 13th or something when I went out and then I was in a halfway house for a couple of months, right? I was in a halfway house for like six weeks. So I was sentenced to 15 months and I did like 89% of that time. And, uh, I get out in July with $25 to my name and, uh, go to the halfway house. And I spent the $25 on food and a bus pass to be able to try to, uh, I wasn't going to find a job cause I wasn't going to work for six weeks for somewhere and them know that I was in a halfway house. So I just kind of, you know, acted like I was job searching every day for, for a while. And I go meet my friends around town and shit like that. And when I got out, of the halfway house, a friend of mine, ironically, the same dude that bailed me out of jail for the, the domestic violence charge, uh, said, Hey man, I, I work at this other mortgage company now. Cause I was good at mortgages. He's like, they'll, they'll give you a job despite your record. And I was like, man, fuck the mortgage industry. I've been in prison for 15 months watching people say that it was ending and it was a terrible business to be in. I don't know what I want to do with my life. Really. I was just feeling like a little pity party, you know? And he goes, oh, man, you, you should really check. It's a big bank. They got a lot of money, a lot of reserves. They're not going out of business. They're very, they're very conservative bank, and it's the largest privately held mortgage bank in Texas at the time. And I was like, all right, fuck it. I went in there, and I interviewed, and I was like, man, I got to get this job. I got to get, like, I got to snap out of it. I got to get this job. I got to get my shit together. Dude, for two hours, I closed this motherfucker and give me a job. He must have told me no a hundred times. Man, you got two felonies. Man, you got, I don't give a fuck. You put me in here, I'll run circles around anybody working in here. Watch me, I'll fucking make more money than the CEO. I got 15 months worth of shit I need to catch up on. And I held true to my word. Within 90 days, they had to print new plaques because nobody had ever done as much business as I had done. Like, and I was just like, dude, I was hungry. And I was doing, one man, just me, I was doing more than teams of five and six. Right. Like I was just like, there would be teams of five and six that couldn't keep up with me. I was just a one man money making machine, man. And that's what I do. I'm a rainmaker. And I had a lot of pent up aggression. And I was trying to prove the, to her, the wife and I divorced while I was in prison. She sent me a letter about six months in saying, oh, what, here's what happened. I fucked the landscaper. Here's the divorce papers. And, you know, you can you can either, you know, sign these papers or spend more money when you get out. You might as well just sign these papers. I'm like, fuck it. You can have it all, whatever, you know. So I had a lot to make up. And plus, I knew that she probably still kept a, somewhat of an eye on me. And I wanted to just like prove to myself that this that this bitch wasn't the determining factor in who the fuck I was supposed to be in life. Well, about that time, Facebook came on the scene. And so I started posting on Facebook, you know, hoping that she would see it about me being top producer, about me making money and buying cars and buying a house and get my life back together. And people started hitting me up on Facebook going, I wasn't saying to rub it. I was saying it subliminally to rub it in her face, but I was just saying it on Facebook, you know, happy about, hey, you guys know I went to prison, but guess what? Here's what's going on in my real life, and I'm fucking killing it. I'm back, you know. And by the end of 2009, I closed 183 mortgages in the worst economy in, in our lifetime, especially in that business. And so I had broken records that people just like would, thought was unheard of by myself, not with a fucking team. This is by myself, right? If you did some one mortgage every other day of the year, you know, like I was fucking getting it. And so, uh, again, that's, that counts weekends and everything. That means I was closing one deal every other day for an entire year straight. And so, dude, I, and, and I made like $300,000, you know, I was, I was, I was crushing it and, uh, considerably right right now. Shit. We do that in a couple weeks, but back then, you know, that was crushing it for me. And so, especially coming from where I came from, the, the, the scenario and shit. So I, uh, 2010 rolls around and Obama signed something into law called the Dodd-Frank Act. And one of the things the Dodd-Frank Act did was it took the licenses that were given out to loan officers were state licenses. And it took them away from the state and made them federal licenses. Well, I had just left federal prison less than a year ago. Uh, it would be it's less than two years ago because it was March of 2010 when it went into effect. The feds wouldn't give me a license. So like I was out of a job. So when people, a lot of times they say those who coach can't, I literally couldn't. And I could have went and got a job maybe at Bank of America and probably closed them on it too and got all that. But I was like, man, I'm not following my calling. You know, I got this calling to be this Napoleon Hills, Zig Ziglar, fucking Tony Robbins guy. 
And here I am, I'm, I'm like, I see the cycle repeating itself, you know? And so I went and saw one of my friends who had been doing this internet marketing stuff. And I said, hey man, what do you think I should do? And he goes, I'm gonna give you these DVDs and you can watch how to build a sales funnel and this other stuff. And dude, this was back when you had to code and use WordPress and all this other shit, right? When the click funnels, lead pages, easy to do stuff that we have these days. And so I built this funnel and I saved up a little money from working in the mortgage industry. Obviously, I had been remarried at this time, married my high school sweetheart, been remarried, saved up a little money. And, and I, had, I didn't know this was coming to an end. So she had quit her job and I was you know, doing the full time thing. And I fucked up our whole entire life savings on a pay per click campaign that worked. But the rules changed and it was a mortgage campaign and the rules changed. And people started hitting me refunds because the Dodd-Frank Act got rid of that too. But I didn't know because I wasn't in the business no more. And so like literally I was, I was flat busted broke and I had to move in with her parents. And all this is documented on my YouTube channel. Like you can scroll back through my YouTube channel and you can see this shit happening. Top of the world, bottom of the fucking – like I go – like people say sometimes you got to hit back rock bottom to bounce back up. Sometimes you got to go to rock bottom. And like me, I like to carry a jackhammer down there just to see if I can dig a little bit deeper, you know. And uh, if I'm going to do anything, I'm going to do it in excess, you know. And so I, – I, but I knew that I could make money because I had made money. It just didn't work out happily ever after. And so I, I said, okay, well, you know, you learn through failing. I said, okay, I failed. What experiences did I learn? Okay, obviously scale. Don't just dump. Like don't dump all your money into something. Scale that shit and make sure that it works properly. And so I started managing people's social media. I said, hey, you know what? I actually did a lot of business from people on Facebook hitting me up saying, hey, we do my loans. So I'm going to teach other loan officers how to do this. My, fuck it. I'm going to do it for them. And so I started managing social media. And I charged like, dude, imagine this. You could get me to run your social media, post three times a day on your Facebook account for a hundred bucks a month. Right? Like, imagine that's what that, back then I wasn't Ryan Stuman, the hardcore. I was just like Ryan Stuman, convicted felon that lost his job, you know? But I, I did that for about 70 people. So imagine how much fucking work I'm doing every day pretending to be 70 people. I didn't have a team, it was just fucking me. And uh, obviously that got really exhausting really quick. And, uh, and I made the decision that, you know, I'm going to teach now that I've seen the results that I've got for these 70 people, I'm just going to start teaching people how to do this shit. And this was way before Facebook was a thing. You know, back in 2012, if you're like, hey, you can make money from Facebook, people would be like, you mean where my friends are? No, nah, I don't think so. And I had to like look, craft my sales pitch. Like people buy from people they know, like, and trust. Your friends know, like, and trust you, right? Have you ever seen your friends move into a house? And then you're like, hell, why didn't you call me? It's because they don't know that that's what you do because you're not doing it right on Facebook. And so I started teaching people how to organically market themselves on Facebook. And I charged $1,000 for this little course that I had and started making money from it. And then people said, well, how can I work with you directly? And I started charging, I think, $5,000 to work with me directly to you know, coach them in, in, in the business side of things. And then I started break, – and that was all done under Hardcore Closer, like my little moniker. And then I started the Hardcore Closer website in 2012. It started growing and getting popular and, you know, getting, you know, went from getting 300 hits a month to 3,000 hits a month to 10,000 hits a month. And now it gets, you know, millions of hits a year. And, you know, I make this transition and I just keep like plugging away. I create Break Free Academy and we start doing live, live events, small events for like 50 or less people. It, at first there were like five people and now there's like 50 people that come to, we start doing these small events and I start taking on coaching clients, one-on-one -on -one coaching clients and group coaching clients. And the next thing you know, I look back and you know, hell I've helped thousands of people. I've helped people that are on TV. I've helped people that pay, play professional sports and I have celebrities that I don't like really revealing the, the names of, you don't see me give a lot of testimonials and shit because I, I try to keep everybody's business private, but I've helped a lot of famous people. And I look and I'm like, dude, I'm working with these celebrities. I'm working with these like star athletes. I'm working with these high performers and all this other stuff. And, and I'm like, man, and they all took a chance on me long before anybody else did. And then in 2014, I got divorced uh, again. My, uh, my ex-wife, she's like, you know, when I married you, you W2, you were khakis to work and you had a banking job. She's like, you've just changed. But the thing is, I changed into who I am today, Ryan like Ryan, like never, I was born Ryan Russell McCord. So at age seven, I lost my identity. I became Ryan Keith Stuman, but I've always been Ryan. And so I just became Ryan in 2014. I started telling the story that I'm telling you right now. And I just own that shit. Like, yeah, I went to fucking jail for domestic abuse. I didn't do it, but it fucking got set up. Then I went to prison and shit got fucked up. I lost my license. And I started telling that story and people started going, dude, you're like the only real motherfucker out there. Everybody else has got these bullshit stories. Like you're the only one that's really seen some shit 
that's not afraid to talk about it. You know, and, and I had this crippling marijuana addiction, man, because I was smoking so much pot trying to run from everything. You know, it's like it was the only thing that kept me going because I had so many demons and so many regrets and fear of loss and fear of abandonment. And, and, you know, I was able to kick it not too long ago. I stopped smoking weed earlier this year and my life's dramatically changed uh, since that. You know, that was one more. That was like the last real trick from the force of average that was fucking me up, you know. And, you know, I started just continuing to push and plug away. And, you know, in 2015, we did our first million. In 2016, we broke through 2 million. Last year, we did, uh, I think, 4 million. And uh, I'll get my tax returns here in a minute. So, I'll, I'll, you know, the next couple of days, so I'll know exactly. But I'm pretty sure we did 3.8 million last year. This year, we're on track to do 10 million, you know, and because uh, it's like, it's definitely ex exploded. And you know, I, I created a lot of haters on the way. A lot of people say, oh, you know, he did this or he did that or he's a convicted felon or whatever. But I find most of those people that say that stuff are that thing. You know what I mean? I find the people that say, oh, he's a convicted felon. I had a guy just on Saturday. He said, hey, man, I've been to I've been to prison. You know, I was adopted. And I said some shit that he didn't like, because when you're a real motherfucker and you get real with fake people, they get upset. They get real mad. And I said some shit that he didn't like. And he said, uh. He, he actually posted in a couple of groups like buyer beware. This guy's a two time felon and, you know, three times divorce, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know what? The groups that he posted in, I guess they knew who I was. I'm a pretty popular dude. You know, it still feels weird to say that, but a pretty popular dude. They're like, do you not watch his shit? Like he talks about that all like you're not fu like fucking shocker. This guy's been hiding it forever. Like, didn't you just find him from a video where he told you that stuff in the video? And now you're like acting like trying to hold it against him. What the fuck is wrong with you? You know, and the dude actually came back and he's like, you know what, man? Fuck, dude. I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't even have done that stuff. And but I deal with that shit every day because I got to be real with people. But that journey wasn't easy. You know, today I, I drove to work in a 2017 NSX. You know, that's a $200,000 car. When I bought it brand new, it was $179,000 on the sticker. I don't pay a sticker for shit. I got that bitch for one forty one. But, you know, uh, and, and, you know, I have two McLarens. Last night I was driving around in, in my white McLaren. I have a green McLaren, too. I have a $100,000 Escalade. I got a $70,000 F-150. I've got a, a Maserati Ghibli, you know, a 2016 Maserati Ghibli. Like, I have nice shit. I live in a, a house that, in Texas, if you have a house that's, you know, over half a million dollars, it's a fucking nice house. You know, I live in a house that's uh, that we're about to sell for $650,000. I own $2 million in debt-free real estate. Uh, investments. Like I paid for most shit with cash. And, uh, you know, it's like I, I live this, what would be considered a dream life, but it's definitely converted from being a nightmare, you know, but I had to have all these experiences so that I could sit here and share them with your audience today. And now, now that I've, we come full circle and I've told you the story. Now you understand why I, I mentioned the things that I mentioned and how this world works and how the brain works and all this other stuff. Cause I've had all these experiences that's led me to this eye opening shit. So if there's one thing that I would say to your audience is don't be afraid of the struggle. The struggle is what opens your mind. The struggle is what makes you like, if you face struggle, you have to figure out a way to solve that problem. And when you figure out a way to solve that problem, you gain experience. And when you gain experience, that's wisdom. It's wisdom that runs this planet and it's experience that runs this planet. I have people with PhDs that hire me and the last grade that I completed in school was the eighth grade. I'm probably the third most successful motherfucker to ever come out of Allen school system. You know, I'm, and I'm probably the most famous fucking person to ever come from the Allen school system, you know, and I don't say that out of like egotism or whatever, but I'm saying, and I didn't even finish that shit, you know, but it's because I've had these experiences that you can't miss me with much. Like I see somebody and I know they're bullshitting. They, I, they can say three or four words to me and I automatically know they're bullshit. You know why? Because I met a million bullshitters when I did four years in prison. You know, I know what that, I know the tone of it. I know the look of it. I can see the body traits. I know all that shit. And it pisses a lot of people off because they're like, well, this guy's full of shit. Like, nah, motherfucker, I know you're full of shit and you're trying to say something first so that it comes against me. I'm the last person to be full of shit because everything about me is on the internet. You wonder, like, you know, unfortunately, like Grant Cardone 60 years old. Tony Robbins is like 64 years old. You, you can't track their origin story because YouTube didn't exist back then. You can track my origin story. The whole fucking story is online, right? Those guys, the same time period of their story is online too. I just happen to be a hell of a lot younger. 10 years ago, I was still in my 20s. You know, 12 years ago when I started making videos and shit like that on the internet, I was in my mid-20s. I was probably close to your age, you know? And so how old are you? I'm 23. I, feel, I was going to say 24, so I was close to your age, you know? 
And uh, and these guys, you know, their origin story is it's I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's true. I'm just saying that, you know, it's not documentable. Like you can't say that I bullshit my way through anything because it's all on film. It's like been the Ryan Stuman reality show for, you know, 10, 12 years now. And uh, even before prison, you know, you can go back and look at my MySpace account and my Facebook account and shit like that. So, but it, it's been a hell of a journey, but it's all been through experiences. And I'll say this to, to kind of wind down the show is all those things that I went through in life were strength conditioning because I carry a lot of the fucking weight on my shoulders. I'm strong, you know, and I don't mean I'm physically strong too, but I mean, I'm strong. I'm mentally tough. I'm mentally callous. I can carry weight. I can deal with problems. If you, I can deal with your problems. I can deal with, the, I've got thousands of clients right now. I can deal with their problems. I can deal with my employees problems, my home problems. Like I know how to deal with that shit. So all this shit was experience and strength conditioning to only make me that much stronger, which now I would say I'm pretty much unstoppable. That is incredible. That is incredible. So, Ryan, you know, I really do appreciate your time uh, on the show so far. I just have two more questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, so the first question is, you know, we talked about a lot about your past and about, you know, what you're doing now. But what does the future hold for you? Where do you see yourself going in the next 5, 10, 20, 50 years? Going in the same path I'm on now, man, sharing this story and helping people break through. You know, as, as computers take over more jobs and artificial intelligence puts more people out of work, they're going to need me to explain to them what the next thing is. They're going to need for me to, to teach them how to evolve. Uh, I do a lot of real estate, too, because as more people lose their job, that means the government's got to pay for more and more housing. So I want to collect those checks as far as a business standpoint to, to suffice. But my whole end goal would be to one day be able to do the things that I do now for free and make my money from real estate and, and working with the government and stuff like that. And the next, and this may be an unpopular opinion for youngsters, but in the next four years, I'd like to work directly with Donald Trump again. I'm a Trump university graduate and, uh, and I'd like to work directly with him again. He was a, a great mentor to me back, you know, 10 years ago when I went through Trump university the first time. And uh, the, whether you believe in it or not, I like his, I like what he's doing. And I think that, you know, the news is full of shit and, and, I see the economy and stuff like that, and, and I want to help him get reelected, and I want to be a part of his, his – I want to be the guy that Trump says, hey, man, look at this fucking dude. He's the example of prison reform. He got out and got his shit together and totally says, fuck your excuses. You know, I don't look at our country as needed to be ran by like some morally sound – is Donald Trump perfect? Absolutely not. And not, I'm not going political here at all, but what I'm saying is I don't look at a country as needing to be ran by someone with great morals. Obama had great morals, right? Uh, it, 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 but the country went under because he didn't have a good business thing. You know what I'm saying? I think a country needs to be ran like a business and I like it when the country's ran like a business. So that's what I want to help. But I also want to be the, the voice of prison. You know, uh, I'm going to speak at federal prison here in a couple of months, going back to the fucking house of hate to change those guys life. And so I want to be able to do stuff like that, but not have to rely on the, the money from him. Right now, I need the money to you know support my lifestyle and everything else, but I'm transitioning my investments to be able to take care of that for me to where I can give back in a bigger way. Um, I have a, a podcast called Get Your Mind Right. If you'll give me the first five to seven minutes of your day, that's all they are. It's five to seven minutes. You just roll out of bed, put your headphones on or turn your speaker on and listen to my voice the first five to seven minutes of your day. Give me 60 days of your life. Your shit will be rewired. Like I'm telling you, give me 60 days of your life. First thing in the morning, not at the end of the day, not in the middle of the day. First thing in the morning in 60 days, your life will be dramatically different than it is right now. That's incredible. And, and again, I highly encourage everybody to to go listen. Uh, you know, how, what's the best way for, for everybody to, to find your show? Uh, I, I it's everywhere. So you can go to hardcorecloser.com. All my shit's there. Uh, but it's on iTunes, YouTube, like so. I mean, you know, you can search my name and it everything comes up. It's pretty easy. The best place to follow me though on social media is Instagram. I'm at Hardcore Closer. So follow me over on Instagram. Leave me a message. Say you saw me on this show, and uh, you know, I, I post a lot of inspirational videos. And a lot of people know me as a sales guy, and I am a sales guy. There's lots of sales content. Uh, Hardcore Closer's just kind of always been my nickname, uh, but it's not necessarily. Uh, who I am, you know what I mean? Like what I represent. Do I teach people sales? Yeah, but like that's like 10% of what I teach people. And am I good at it? I'm like one of the best in the world at it. But again, it's like 10% of what I teach. A lot of what I teach is mindset, business, lead generation. Because look, you can be the greatest salesman in the world. If you ain't got nobody to talk to, you go broke as hell. 
You could also be the worst salesperson in the world, but if you got a million people trying to buy your product, you could suck at sales and still be rich. So I, I teach that kind of mindset in marketing and stuff like that. So absolutely. And uh, you know, Ryan, again, I really do appreciate your time. Last question I have for you today. Um, you know, we we've been talking a lot about about yourself and about your story. Uh, and I've asked you a few questions here and there, but what question should I be asking you? You know, you have all the wisdom and the experience. What questions should I be asking you that I did not think to ask today? Hmm. I would say, like, uh, like, how did I – like, a good question for me was what happened when you became a millionaire? I think a lot of people just think that you became a millionaire and you were happily ever after. And I think a good question is, like, okay, so you became a millionaire, then what? And, and I'll tell you, the answer is real simple. That then I removed any limitations from my life because if I could do that, I feel like I could do anything. So when I set goals, not limits, a lot of people set a goal and they make it a limit. Oh, if I could just make a million dollars, that's my goal. And then, but really what they did was they set a limit on their self. So it's a real big difference, right? So set goals and make sure you know the difference between goals and limits. Goals are meant to be broken and then pushed and then broken and pushed and broken and pushed. And I live a truly unlimited lifestyle and that's the life, the mindset that I have. And that's really what the biggest shift was. Like I made a million and then what? Well, then it was like 10. And then it's going to be 50 and it's going to be 100. And then I'm going to be looking for bees, you know, and it's again, it's not about money for me. But if I have a billion dollars, that just means that I brought that much change and value to the marketplace. The money's the byproduct of the thing that I did to get it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Ryan, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I really do appreciate you coming on and sharing everything that you have. And uh, to everybody listening, you know, I really appreciate you guys listening. You guys are the reason that we do this, and I love you guys. So thank you so much for listening and tuning in. Uh, Ryan, what else can I say, man? Thank you so much. Um, you know, if you uh, you want to take the last maybe 30, sec 30, 60 seconds and wrap up. Yeah, so you guys follow me on Instagram at Hardcore Closer. Go over to HardcoreCloser.com. You can find all my resources and stuff over there. I've written almost 2,000 blog posts. I've done 600 podcasts. I've been, I'm an OG at this, man. I've been at this shit for a long time. So whether you're looking for mindset stuff or sales stuff or marketing stuff or, you know, shit advice on what it's like to be divorced three times or survive prison or whatever, just go over there and check all that stuff out. And lastly, I would just ask that you share my stuff with your friends. If this resonated with you, if you know somebody needs to hear this, if you see something on my site that you know somebody needs to hear, don't be a little bitch and be fearful of sharing it with somebody. Share it with somebody that needs to hear it so that we can change their life. That's my mission on this planet is to change lives. And if you feel like this enlightened you, then you owe it to other people that you know to enlighten them as well. Fantastic. Again, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Everybody, this has been another Project Day interview. Today we've been talking to Ryan Steumann from Dallas, Texas. Take care.